Okay, so if you are ready, Amelia, we will get going. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's SEDS Online webinar. Hopefully, as uh, you heard, a fatigue-free <laughs> zone in terms of Zoom. And um, so my name is Chelsea Pedersen, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting. And today I'm coming from you from the University of Bochum in Germany. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsorship from the IAS, as, as always, who really helps allow us to provide all of this material for you online and the website free of charge. Um, there's a bunch of recorded lectures, seminars, there's different learning tools, virtual field trips, so make sure and check it out. Um, one reminder, in case you are participating in any of the coffee breaks, the coffee breaks are now running again. So you can check out the schedule on the SEDS Online website. And you don't have to be within a certain region to attend one of those coffee breaks. So if you're interested or have um, a free spot in your day during a different uh, region, you can always just join whichever coffee break suits you best. All right, so today's lecture is by Dr. Amelia Yurakowska, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Paleontology at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, um, where she also received her PhD. Amelia just finished a visiting professorship at the University of Vienna, focusing on biomineralization and sclerochronology. And her research really focuses on biomineralization and stratigraphic paleobiology. And she has a special focus on conodonts, which I hear we'll see a little bit of today. And today she's gonna to talk to us about the various controls on the formation of both carbonate and phosphate. And with that, Amelia, um, thank you so much for joining us and I will give you the mic. Thank you, Chelsea and, uh, and Stephen as well for organizing this and for having me here. And I would like to thank uh, everybody who joined this talk. Um, this is quite intimidating to have all, all of you here. Um, and I just wanted to explain uh, because uh, Stephen was a bit put off by the title. And I, I, this is just me being goofy uh, because probiotic means uh, I've been trying to look at microbial carbonates, which uh, will be the, f uh, f the f one of the focuses of this talk. Uh, so this is uh, what, uh, what caused this uh, strange title. Um, so uh, this talk will uh, have three parts. Uh, I will be talking about uh, two different uh, projects that involved uh, a method called EBSD or electron backscatter diffraction. So for those of you who have not been exposed to this uh, method yet, I will give a very quick intro and then I will move on to the first example which uh, involves carbonates. And the second example, which is ongoing, and this is a joint project with my PhD student, Brian Shirley, um, which uh, attempts to use EBSD in phosphates, and this is much more difficult. Um, so electron backscatter diffraction is a method that originally comes from uh, material sciences. And uh, there are two main applications, uh, and I've borrowed these figures from a very recent paper by Jarosław Stolarski and colleagues, which I really recommend because uh, it uh, really showcases beautifully uh, how we can use uh, this method to investigate biomineralization, uh, in this case in corals, uh, using EBSD. And uh, the first application is the identification of uh, various um, uh, mineralogical phases uh, at a very small scale and in situ. And this is illustrated here when we have a um, EBSD map, which shows orientations of, uh, um, in this case, individual pixels. Uh, so these are crystallographic orientations, but it shows also the two phases. The first phase is calcite. Uh, this is the center of calcification here, and this is aragonite. Uh, so if you, if you look at the uh, scale, it would be very difficult to resolve uh, this with any other method. Certainly you don't want to powder your sample because then you will not know where these different phases are. Um, and the second application is uh, the measurement of uh, the so-called micro texture in situ. And that uh, is this, uh, these are these colors that you see on this map. Uh, the colors correspond to the orientations of crystallographic axis. 
Um, and this can also be expressed uh, using the so-called pole figures, which you see here, these are two examples uh, for the Aragonite uh, phase. Uh, so this is the legend. Uh, and the, the legend shows you how to uh, interpret the colors, but the pole figures in themselves already show you the distribution of individual pixels on this map. So this one, for example, uh, so the left one, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, uh, it's, um, it's from the B-axis. So we're looking towards the B-axis and uh, this one is from the A-axis. So you can see uh, the grains rotating around the C-axis in different directions. Uh, I know that for someone who has not been working with pole figures, it takes a while to kind of switch the right uh, interpreter in your brain. Um, but I will be explaining them uh, when they appear in this talk. Uh, so just very briefly, so you can imagine how we do this in the lab. Um, EBSD is a method that can be fitted to most uh, SEM uh, microscopes by adding a, a special detector. And um, we shoot an electron beam on a sample and the sample has to be tilted uh, typically by 70 degrees. Uh, so the electron beam comes from the top, gets diffracted, and the diffraction patterns are registered on a phosphorus screen uh, that is at the end of our detector. So that all sounds not too complicated, but uh, actually we uh, often run into many difficulties and you will hear about them a little bit. Uh, so sorry, this is a bit uh, technical, uh, but I, I, I talk to you through this. Uh, what, what I really want to show here is that when uh, the electron beam gets diffracted, it's diffracted by um, the uh, crystal lattice of the mineral that we're shooting at. So if you have an amorphous sample, you will not get any diffraction pattern. But if your uh, sample has a crystal lattice, um, you can resolve um, the type of lattice, so basically the mineral and the dimensions, and sometimes even the formations in this uh, mineral, um, using these uh, uh, cones of diffraction that are recorded on the phosphorus screen. And the, these cones actually are, you know, cones. They 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 would they would um, form a uh, bent line. So, uh, but because the phosphorus screen is very small, we see them as essentially straight lines. And they are called uh, Kikuchi patterns after uh, the researcher who discovered them. And uh, we can calculate um, the, uh, the parameters of uh, the crystal lattice using fairly simple um, uh, equations. So uh, we definitely have to know uh, the, the wavelength and the wavelength depends basically on your acceleration voltage. So for any given acceleration voltage, you can find out uh, what, uh, how to interpret your uh, Kikuchi patterns in order to reconstruct the crystal uh, lattice. Mm -hmm. And this is how they look like. This is actually the same uh, mineral at different uh, acceleration voltages. Uh, this is from a very good textbook. If you would like to get into EBSD, I really recommend starting uh, uh, with uh, Goldstein et, et al. Uh, so with a uh, higher acceleration voltage, um, you might be able to resolve uh, sharper Kikuchi bands, but it doesn't help us very much as sedimentologists because this works very well with metals <laughs> uh, and it works very well for material scientists, but uh, for the type of uh, minerals that the sedimentologists, uh, especially carbonate sedimentologists, tend to work with, uh, this acceleration may be too high. So we'll be uh, using these blurry uh, patterns uh, that we see on the top. At least this is what I have to do. Um, and this is uh, the last step, which uh, I would like to highlight here. So when you have uh, acquired your Kikuchi bands, and they have been interpreted as a given um, mineral, you end up uh, with uh, a map. And this map corresponds to the surface of your sample in the SEM. So um, you get uh, a value uh, reconstructed for any given pixel on your uh, map. 
So this, the, this reflects the spatial resolution of your EBSD analysis. Uh, and as you can see here uh, in this example, this is, uh, this is an example from um, a paper. Uh, so this is not carbonate actually. Um, it is quite easy to assign them to grains based on the orientation. So uh, I really want to stress here because this is, this is going to be important for later in this talk that what we uh, define as individual grains or uh, crystallites, uh, so uh, scattering domains, uh, which basically means uh, areas which diffract in the same way, um, can be very arbitrary. It is probably not very arbitrary here, although you can see that if you just wanted to join the fields of uh, similarly oriented uh, pixels, you might end up with a lot of uh, spurious small grains that are not really grains, it's just uh, there was not a, a lot of signal in this area. And this is where we need good um, algorithms and also good understanding of uh, the minerals we're looking at uh, to identify grains in a meaningful way. Uh, and uh, Chelsea was asking me about this and I would really like to recommend, I don't get any commissions for this, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is an open access um, uh, toolbox for analyzing EBSD data, which was developed by uh, a group of mathematicians. And um, I really often feel like I would love to see how people analyze their data because I'm learning and I'm trying to um, apply the same methods to my uh, to my data. And uh, if you use um, software that comes with like large, large uh, uh, commercial um, detectors, it does not record exactly what you clicked. So there's a lot of uh, things that you, you kind of have to make an assumption or use the default functions. And uh, for a reader afterwards, like me, it is often hard to find out exactly what criteria have been applied to identify grains. And you will see how I'm struggling with this later. <laughs> so the first, um, example I wanted to focus on uh, is the identification of biologically mediated uh, carbonates. So in my PhD, which is uh, already a few years ago, uh, I was working on uh, Silurian carbonates and um, they are characterized by appearances of um, what has been proposed as a proliferation of microbial structures. And um, as you uh, know, not all carbonates are born the same, <laughs> which sounds a bit cruel. Uh, so carbonates obviously are born, not made in most cases, uh, but also not all of them are biominerals. Uh, not all of them are uh, precipitated in a biologically controlled way uh, by the organisms that make them. And so, uh, the mechanism that leads to the production has uh, implications for the entire carbonate uh, factory. Uh, and so this is the very famous um, summary by Schlager, where he identified also the uh, microbial M uh, carbonate factory. Um, and the dynamics of uh, this carbonate production is different. And it has been proposed uh, during the Silurian. And we have periods, which I marked here, uh, uh, just roughly uh, in blue lines, um, uh, in, during which uh, we see proliferation of uh, microbial carbonates uh, in pretty every, pretty much every carbonate platform uh, that we have preserved from this time slice. And they are associated with uh, carbon isotope excursions. So this green line here, this is uh, the carbon uh, isotope curve uh, as a composite curve for the entire Silurian. And um, you can see that uh, these excursions go up to almost uh, nine per mil, which is really a lot. We don't have any actualistic um, examples of excursions that high. Uh, and strangely, uh, and this is also something that AXA, who I, th I think is in the audience, uh, has investigated as well. And I think there are maybe some other people here in the audience who have also been looking at this. Um, and uh, it has been suggested by Mikael Karna at Lund University that they represent anachronistic fascias 
uh, which are associated with uh, carbon cycle perturbation and uh, extinction and maybe disappearance of some grazing organisms. Um, so when I was doing field work for my uh, PhD, I, uh, I went to um, a number of uh, tropical carbonate platforms in the Baltic Basin, which today means uh, the area between um, Sweden, Estonia, um, uh, Ukraine and Poland. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a microbial reef from the middle Silurian. Uh, so these cauliflower-like structures, uh, they have been proposed that uh, to be to be pr uh, formed by um, microbes, and you can see they are huge. And this reef uh, is almost entirely uh, made of this structure, so it doesn't have a lot of skeletal carbonized, but it is a prominent feature in the topography. So they uh, these structures are not just uh, you know flakes of microbialites flake, uh, swimming around in matrix; they are reforming. Uh, and if you go elsewhere, whoops, sorry, what happened here? All right, uh, so these are uh, examples from my work in Ukraine. Um, and you can see that uh, they also quite diverse. So we have this very fluffy uh, onchoids, uh, which uh, are typically called uh, spongiostromate. Uh, we have these very weird structures here, which uh, are quite big, and they also sometimes almost rock forming. and I really have no idea what they are. I believe they are called ortonella or something like this. This one here is growing on a um, stromatoporoid, uh, but it has also been interpreted as a microbial structure. Uh, I think this one is called Hedstremia. Uh, and this uh, probably would be assigned to uh, something called Roth placella. So I don't want to overwhelm you with these different names. What I want to say is that um, they have been classified as different morphologies and they're very abundant, but we don't know what they are. And uh, this is an example from uh, the Midland platform in, uh, in England, uh, also from uh, the Middle Silurian. Uh, so uh, again, we were looking at um, microbial reefs or what has been interpreted as uh, thrombolytic reefs with clotted microite, and uh, they are surrounded by oncolytic uh, skeletal uh, rudstones and uh, floatstones. Um, and I was um, looking for ways to quantify, do we really have more microbial carbonates here when we don't know exactly what is carbonate? Uh, it is very hard to tell how much of this uh, microite here is microbial. We don't know if all these um, structures really are uh, microbial carbonates or are they uh, skeletal? Um, and so first I started etching them and putting them under the SEM, uh, but you can see this is all overwhelmed by uh, the cement that grows around it. So it didn't help a lot. And this is um, where um, I started thinking about um, crystallography. Um, and this is uh, a topic that has been bothering people for quite a while because uh, we also want to know when the first microbial carbonates uh, appear in the fossil record. And uh, it is generally expected that they should be microbial. Um, but the problem is mm, if we look at cyanobacteria today, uh, the way uh, the car carbonate is precipitated on uh, the surface of these cells, is not really controlled uh, by the organism. So they don't um, are, make this pretty structured shells that, as we see, for example, in thin sections in, uh, uh, in, of mollusks. Uh, the precipitation of carbonate is, so to say, a byproduct of the physiological processes of the cyanobacterium. Uh, so by locally changing the acidity, the pH, um, and the, by the uptake of CO2 for uh, uh, the photosynthesis, um, the organism leads to the precipitation of uh, calcium carbonate on its surface. Uh, but uh, how it looks uh, is not as well controlled, although uh, there is a lot of organic matrix that participates in the precipitation. So uh, at the time when I was looking at this, uh, it was not even so well understood. Um, it's already been a few years, uh, so uh, there has been a lot of research uh, 
published about this process since then. Um, but I started with very primitive tools and uh, I looked at one of the organisms that um, uh, was very prominent in uh, these reefs uh, and it was uh, at that time called Wederedella. Uh, and uh, you find it everywhere. It forms uh, large oncoids, it forms reefs uh, and it uh, looks like sausages. Uh, uh, with uh, rows of pores, um, and we find them in the Ordovician, uh, in, in the Silurian, I believe they also found in the Vonian, um, but uh, nobody knew what they are, and they have been generally assigned to uh, microbial structures. Um, by talking to Axel, uh, uh, I realized that we seem to find um, 3D aspects of these uh, structures uh, when we isolate a shell fragment. So in this case, this is a trilobite shell fragment uh, from um, not very well latified uh, sediments. It was, it was marly. Uh, so we washed it and um, on the surface we can see these epibions. So uh, I've put these epibions in resin and I sectioned them and guess what? Inside was uh, the same structure, or so I believe. So uh, this is an etched SEM uh, photo. Uh, the, the globular structures inside, that's uh, pyrite, so don't worry about this. Um, but this is the shell of this organism. So it has a shell, um, which made me think it's probably not um, a microbial product. Um, uh, but we wanted to check this. So in C sections, uh, the outer edge uh, appeared micritic, and this micritic uh, wall uh, is something that we find in most of these uh, microbial structures. Um, but it's really very hard to tell exactly what the structure of the wall is, even in etched uh, thin section, because it's so small. And uh, you can see the inside is filled with, um, with cement. Um, and uh, it gets even harder when you look at these tinier bits here. So say if these are sausages, this must be spaghetti, obviously. And when we look at this spaghetti, it has, um, uh, it looks like chains of uh, beads. Uh, it, it looks, um, um, it looks like uh, a row of cells uh, which have micritic uh, uh, walls and they are just filled with cement. So it's very hard to characterize them morphologically. Um, and this is where ABSD comes in. Uh, so uh, maybe let me go back to these sausages. These are uh, the uh, Wederadella specimens they've put in resin. And I uh, analyzed them uh, in EBSD. Uh, it was, uh, the analysis was actually done by my master student, Jan Philipp Peslau, uh, who wrote a fantastic thesis about this and it is published. Um, so the colors, just to remind you, uh, represent orientations of grains. So grains in this case are reconstructed, so they are connected with a line. And uh, the white line uh, is the uh, outline of the, of the structure. And inside, uh, you can see this, uh, the wall uh, of the uh, organism. I guess it's an organism. Um, so if you, if you wanna have a look back uh, at the previous uh, slide, if you look at the edge section, you would think that uh, the crystals are arranged uh, in a parallel way uh, to, the, to the surface of the shell. And we find this very often that etching is misleading and it doesn't really show the orientation, the crystallographic orientation, or um, sometimes the crystallographic orientation will be the opposite of what uh, is visible in an etched section. Mm -hmm. This is the case here. Uh, because the grains are actually uh, perpendicular to the surface of the shell. And we'll see this very often. Now, uh, these pole figures refer to different areas uh, of the specimen. And you can see uh, this, the first, the top row uh, is when we look from the top of the uh, C axis. So we look C axis down. Um, and you can see that uh, the C axis is uh, perpendicular to the surface of the shell, whereas uh, the A axis um, 
this we're looking at uh, calcite this time. In the first slides, I was showing aragonite. This is calcite. Calcite crystallizes in a hexagonal system. Uh, so uh, it has only uh, it has only it has only three a axes. It doesn't have a b axis. Um, so we see this uh, kind of girdle structure where uh, the individual crystals rotate ar ar around the c axis, and this rotation goes along. Um, uh, as we, it moves gradually as we go along the uh, shell. So uh, this is quite a constrained uh, crystallographic texture. Uh, it is quite orderly. Um, it uh, is not something that would, we would expect in a microbial uh, carbonate. Um, there is a measure of um, order that is commonly used, which is the misorientation angle. So by uh, by how much are adjacent uh, crystals uh, rotated against each other. And the distribution of misorientations is something that is often used uh, to express uh, the crystallographic order. Um, and uh, the misorientations go up to 60 degrees, but what we uh, noticed is that um, the, the, the orientation of um, misorientation axis is very constrained. And now this is maybe the trickiest part uh, because each uh, misorientation is um, a mismatch between two grains. So if two grains are parallel, um, they, uh, they will have a zero misorientation. But if they are misoriented, they can be misoriented along different axes. And so we can analyze um, the distribution uh, of orientations of misorientation axis. Um, and this is what we uh, analyze here. Uh, in these, these graphs uh, are called inverse pole figures. And we see that uh, misorientation axes that are very narrow, uh, they, they are very common. Whereas axes uh, that go above 30 degrees are, are quite constrained. So um, in this case, uh, we found it useful to uh, constrain uh, the, um, uh, the, the cross graphic texture. And when we look at the, uh, these uh, beds of, um, these chains of beads that, uh, that look a little bit like spaghetti, uh, which are called rosplatella, we found that uh, the um, orientations of misorientation axis are uh, distributed evenly across all um, values. So uh, regardless uh, uh, how far away this uh, misorientation axis uh, uh, reaches, it is equally common. Um, and uh, on top of that, we also noticed that uh, we don't have this uh, obvious uh, rotation that we've seen in Alonema. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the orientations of grains seem to be rather, um, I want to say random or uniform, so we don't see uh, uh, preferred orientations very much. Uh, so again, just to remind you, these are uh, different areas uh, in, the, uh, in this grain. This grain is very small, as you can see, so the, the, we don't have such, such a big data set. Um, the last column are all uh, measurements combined. And you can see that really we don't have any preferred orientations. Um, so this is what we interpreted as being truly uh, not biologically controlled, uh, so biologically mediated perhaps, as opposed to uh, the previous one, the alonema, which was also problematic, but we think uh, it was biologically controlled. Now, we need a benchmark, something that is truly and for sure biologically controlled to compare. And so to account for possible um, environmental effects, diagenesis and preservation, we used a trilobite from the same samples. So the, these were all the same thin sections. This is a trilobite fragment uh, in the backscatter image. Um, and you can see already from the colors that the orientations are very constrained. And that's uh, visible in the pole figures where all the C axes are very narrowly clustered in one place. Um, 
and the uh, rotation around the c-axis is also extremely well constrained and voila uh, we can see that the uh, misorientation axes are also extremely well constrained so this would be our um, reference for biologically uh, controlled paraminerals. Interestingly, uh, in all of these specimens, uh, just the range of misorientations and uh, the distributions of misorientations did not show any substantial differences. Uh, so even though this is mostly reported in papers, um, it was not uh, indicative to, for, to answer our question. So when I went back to look at other people's papers and uh, compare our results, it was very often finding the uh, distribution of misorientation angles, but very rarely uh, the, uh, the orientations of misorientation axis would be reported. Uh, so I would be really curious to hear about uh, people who do similar research and uh, have been looking at these parameters as well. Um, and just uh, to top this story, I wanted to mention that uh, we can also count on other forms of preservation to identify uh, these organisms, because I guess we still don't know what made uh, a, lot, a, a large part of the volume of these uh, Paleozoic reefs. So in the case of Rotplatella, um, uh, it has been recently uh, discovered uh, in a piratized preservation. Uh, which provides a counterpart to the um, micritic uh, walls that we have been investigating. Um, the last example I wanted to show you is um, actually uh, not so much sedimentological. So I was hoping we would get some uh, sedimentary phosphate by the time I'm giving this talk. Uh, but we, <laughs> I have to admit, we've had huge uh, difficulties getting uh, to the lab and uh, carrying out our analysis. And uh, my fantastic PhD student, Brian, uh, is in the lab measuring uh, EBSD as we speak. Um, so a lot of uh, what you will see now is uh, I owe to him. Uh, but I think there is a huge overlap between um, biominerals and uh, the diagenetic uh, studies that sedimentologists do. So I think you, I can convince you that uh, there is place to exchange uh, the knowledge. Um, and the examples I will use are conodonts. So conodonts are uh, extinct uh, microfossils, which are made of biological apatite. And this slide is just here to show you that they all look like teeth. Um, they are not homologous with our teeth, but they are quite similar in that they made of uh, uh, phosphate with uh, a small proportion of uh, organics. And apatite is quite easy for carbonate sedimentologists to understand because it also crystallizes in a hexagonal system. Um, and uh, we were trying to uh, analyze um, crystallographic orientations in uh, conodonts, it has not really been done before. So there was one attempt by Alberto Perez Huerta, who is uh, a very um, talented uh, uh, EBSD uh, and biominerals worker. So uh, I have been learning a lot from his papers, but when he tried to um, analyze conodonts, he ran into a problem that we were able to reproduce uh, which uh, was that he was not getting any signal. So uh, these, uh, uh, these squares here, this is where you should be seeing Kikuchi patterns. You cannot see anything. And he got like maybe uh, 20 data points. So that's not enough to analyze. Um, and so he concluded that maybe they were amorphous, which would be very interesting, but uh, I was suspicious of this because you can see them polarized under the... Uh, light microscope. Uh, so we tried, uh, and you can see this, uh, this is a very early try. Uh, so there's a lot of charging in this SEM image, but the worst thing here is uh, to do uh, EBSD, you run an electron beam on your mineral in a series of lines. And uh, in this conodon sample, we see immediately how uh, we basically vaporized uh, the material after one single run. So uh, every time you 
you uh, measure once, your material is gone. This is like a Schrodinger's conodont. Um, and the map that we were getting, uh, I wouldn't say it's completely random, uh, but it's almost empty. Like the indexing uh, rate, so the proportion of pixels that give any signal was uh, below 50%. So for any carbonate specialist, that would be completely unacceptable because when you work with carbonates, we're talking about uh, indexing rates of probably around 95%, uh, tending towards uh, 100%. So we were like, this is terrible. Um, and uh, then uh, my uh, students mostly, I really have to emphasize that uh, I would be nowhere without the help. Uh, so Brian, whom you can see on the right, and Madeleine, uh, who was at that time a bachelor student, they've been perfecting the procedure for um, preparing EBSD analysis. Um, uh, and um, your sample has to be polished really smooth. Uh, with carbonates, it's again, not that difficult, although you really have to be very precise, but uh, phosphate, um, it's just really weird. So uh, we had to reinvent um, uh, the parameters. And I used to say these were two years in the lab, but today I realize it's not two anymore. It's been four years <laughs> that we are doing this. And if you're uh, interested in how uh, to prepare phosphate for a BSD analysis or for EDX analysis, for any ultra structural uh, studies uh, anyway, uh, I really recommend a paper by Brian. Uh, he uh, made a classification of various problems that can uh, occur um, during preparation and uh, try troubleshooting uh, scenarios for uh, different types of problems. So this is really the go uh, to resource for, for your preparation. Uh, but in the end, we were able to get a, uh, a BSD map uh, so this is a, a section for a conodon. This is uh, the lower, uh, the, the upper right, uh, left corner is uh, a backscatter image. And you can see they're not all amorphous. So we do see some uh, crystals, although you can also see scratches here. Um, and the pole figures, again, refer to different areas. Um, I, want, I want to say that the best uh, measured area is here in D. So you can see again, looking at the C axis, um, it is perpendicular to the surface of the sample, uh, which uh, you will remember is different from what we've seen, for example, in Alonima. Um, and it has implications for the material properties of uh, the mineral. And uh, the A axis are again uh, forming a girdle structure, which means that the crystals rotate around the C axis. Um, so, uh, the surface is quite um, well ordered, but if you look into the inside and to the tip of the specimen, the crystals uh, grow very big and um, they seem kind of fused. And I think uh, Chelsea will know, uh, like she will have seen this before, but in carbonates. Uh, in order to ground truth the method, uh, we uh, wanted to uh, try the traditional uh, mineralogical approach. So X-ray diffraction in powdered samples. So I had to uh, powder around uh, 100 milligram of conodons, which is uh, probably around a thousand of microfossils. So I was crying. Uh, and uh, uh, for those of you who are into crystallography, you will realize that our um, sample was very homogeneous in terms of the grain sizes. All the grain sizes were really small and they were about uh, 32 nanometers. And they were um, uh, almost uh, iso, uh, isomorphic. So uh, they were th around 30 nanometers in all directions. So mm -hmm. this is not exactly what we have seen on our EBSD map. And uh, this is not unexpected because in carbonates, which are again our reference uh, group, um, biominerals are typically uh, organized in a hierarchical way. So nacre, which is the go-to uh, biomineral for all kind of studies uh, in a way, uh, we have these nacre platelets that are, um, I don't want to say macroscopic, but uh, they, they large uh, 
uh, in large crystallized, the large scattering domains, but uh, they are actually made of nanocrystals, uh, which are glued together with organics. So we think that what we see here is that uh, the X-ray diffraction is showing us the uh, nanocrystals inside the larger grains that we see in EBSD. Um, and in order to analyze this, we need to be able to measure the size of the grains. And this is where uh, my uncertainty uh, comes in because I will be showing you things that we have not resolved yet. So I would really appreciate uh, any opinions or advice from all of you in terms of uh, how to identify the real size of crystallites in a biomineral that is not actualistic. It does not, does not have any um, reference. Uh, so if you uh, try to resolve the grains, uh, usually you assume a certain um, misorientation between adjacent grains. So if two uh, adjacent areas have a misorientation larger than, for example, five degrees, we treat them as separate grains. And this is what uh, I'm showing here. This is a, a close up of this area here. So you can see that any, um, any place that didn't have enough signal or had some uh, mistake in the measurement will be resolved as a different grain. There are some smoothing uh, algorithms but basically, maybe before I get to this, I want to also highlight uh, these areas in the front and in the center um, that have larger grains. And we don't know if these larger grains are be larger because they're larger, <laughs> because the organism uh, secretes larger grains, or because of diagenesis. Mm -hmm. And this is where I uh, wanted to mention Chelsea's work, because it has really been a source of uh, information for me on how to approach this. Um, the problem is that this is again carbonates. Um, uh, Chelsea was doing experimental diagenesis on uh, Actica Islandica, I think this is. And uh, during diagenesis, uh, she identified uh, with her colleagues um, uh, decreasing misorientation and uh, uh, increasing grain size. So uh, when I saw this, I, I, I thought this is really quite similar to what we see in the sconodons when this is probably the original uh, texture. And uh, as you go towards the front, you see these increased grains and decreasing range of misorientations. But for phosphate, we don't really have uh, good diagenetic models. And also uh, one big difference is um, uh, in carbonates, we have the metastable aragonite, which obviously recrystallizes, but apatite does not have uh, this duality. There's only one uh, mineral, which uh, should be stable. So uh, it is also not clear to me why uh, it should recrystallize. Although we know uh, from the fossil record that it does, because you often find uh, overgrowth on the surface of phosphatic minerals, which take the same orientation. Uh, so diagenesis in phosphate in biophosphate is definitely possible, but how does it happen? And what is the actual original size of the grains? We don't know, at least I don't know. Uh, so th this last part were the results that I'm still working on. And I would be uh, very happy if you can give me your opinions. Um, so I wanted to mention that uh, the analysis of misorientations uh, definitely um, it, it, might, it might be hard to explain in a talk because uh, it's such a um, such a um, technical uh, concept in a way, uh, but it uh, can reveal biological mechanisms. So there's one um, article that I wanted to use as, a, as an example, which analyzed misorientations of uh, adjacent uh, crystals in octocorals, uh, where they identify a specific uh, type of misorientation, which were associated with, uh, um, which resulted from uh, the twinning planes in the crystals, but these twinning planes gave the shape to, uh, the, to the sclerites in the octocoral. So the outside shape is actually a reflection of the crystallographic order inside. Um, and so I would uh, like to be able to compare um, our results with uh, misorientations in a larger set of uh, minerals, 
uh, but they are not always published and they're not always reported. So one of the things I would like to call for is uh, um, providing this information. Uh, also, if, if you work with EBSD and you would like to share them, uh, I would be really grateful for this. And also, um, I think there's uh, a great space for um, identifying how diagenesis affects um, uh, grain size and uh, uh, misorientations. Mm -hmm. So with this, uh, I would like to finish. And I would like to uh, thank especially uh, many students who helped me with this research um, and also my colleagues and uh, the sets online and uh, all of you who survived this far. <laughs> Super, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Amelia. I surely enjoyed it. Um, I hope everybody in the audience did as well. So you can start sending your questions into the chat. Um, please send them to everybody so that uh, I can read them as well. If you send them just to somebody privately, even said online, then um, we don't get to see them. So please um, go about that. While we wait, um, I have one question for you, Amelia, if you don't mind. So I, yeah, so when you're looking at microbial carbonates, we've looked at different types of microbial carbonates as well, um, especially some of the ones that Stephen and I work on in Abu Dhabi. And we often have a hard time, or let's say a harder time um, characterizing them, especially with EBSD, likely due to, um, yeah, very small crystal size and, and different aspects like that. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that that, um, that collecting data with microbial carbonates, especially things like carbonate muds um, or micride, if that is just as reasonable to do in terms of um, data processing as some of sort of the larger like biologically controlled organisms. Um, so, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I want to say I don't think we are saturated with uh, this data yet. So. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think the uh, experiments, the lab experiments that grow microbial carbonates in uh, specific uh, matrices, they have definitely uh, yielded some information about the preferred orientations, which indicate that uh, we should expect some patterns. But I am not sure how these experiments transfer into uh, carbonates that we find in the field. Especially, you know, I've been only looking at fossil ones, and that's a huge drawback of this research. Um, but I'm also not aware of uh, any study that would uh, try to um, compare uh, ultra some um, uh, textures in uh, between field collected microbial carbonates that are extant, where we can identify the origin, and the, the fossil ones where we can never be sure. Yeah, so that would be a really cool comparison, I think. Yeah, that would be interesting. So if anybody out there is doing experimental work on microbial carbonates, um, let me know, because between Amelia and myself, we could definitely do some nice comparisons, I think. Um, so one other question I have for you as we wait for, for the audience to submit theirs. Um, do you think that preferential crystal orientation is always going to be preserved um, following recrystallization, even of biologically controlled organisms? No, and uh, the reason why I think no is your work also. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it can be completely obliterated. Uh, it just, uh, you know, if you have uh, very well ordered uh, calcity crystals, it has to be uh, really uh, brutal diagenetic conditions. And we don't, fortunately, we don't have them very often. Uh, but I think, yes, this is unfortunately possible. Yes, definitely. Okay, we have our first question from the audience um, from Jordan, coming from University of Chicago. Uh, there are different groups of appetite. Um, yeah, hydroxyapatite, like in uh, vertebrates, versus uh, francolide, like in. Uh, Linguolids more in equilibrium with seawater. Do you think that that has something to do with the appetite diagenesis? Uh, yes, uh, I would also like to know exactly how that affects uh, um, diagenesis because um, uh, I have to say, I didn't go into details of different uh, phosphate systematics, but um, 
EBSD has not been very good at distinguishing uh, these uh, phases. So uh, when you uh, do indexing of Kikuchi patterns, uh, they are matched with databases of various uh, crystal lattice uh, parameters in a hydroxyapatite in a francolite. And um, because bioapatite is so sensitive to the electron beam, it disappears so quickly, uh, we uh, just convert everything to apatite, uh, which is quite a brute force method, uh, because we cannot trust um, that the very weak signals that we receive are sufficient to distinguish between these phases. So um, because of this, uh, I don't think it's currently possible to answer this question. I mean, we uh, suspect that it, there would be a difference, but it's probably not measurable at the moment. <laughs> Hmm. Just because of the, mostly because of the sensitivity of the material to the electron beam, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, because we need to use very low acceleration voltages, so the patterns are very blurry, uh, and um, they not very well resolved. So, uh, in if you want to just identify the phase, like apatite versus I don't know um, calcite. Uh, you don't have you don't need such a good patterns, but if you want to uh, distinguish hydroxapatite uh, from francolite and like from different types of apatite, you would need better patterns. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the higher voltage and then the material gets. <laughs> yeah, so we we cannot do this at the moment. I'm afraid. Yeah. So you guys, don't be shy. If you have any questions, please type or even comments, um, suggestions, as Amelia was, was very open saying, you know, this is still sort of working theories. So if you have anything like that, please type them into the chat. Um, so in the meantime, Amelia, what is the next steps uh, in terms of this project? Uh, so actually, uh, as we speak, uh, Brian is uh, at the EBSD uh, microscope and measuring some uh, iron stromatolites uh, with a guest a researcher that we have now in Erlangen, uh, Patricia Dvorak from Poznan University. Um, but with uh, phosphate, um, I still hope to compare this with um, sedimentary phosphate, so not biomineral, but just uh, phosphate that uh, forms, for example, in hard grounds. Um, and I would um, like to um, finish the processing of the uh, conodont um, data set as a as a kind of a you know a reference data set for bioapatite. Um, but I still don't know how to. Um, find out what the original uh, crystal size, uh, how to distinguish original crystals. Uh, uh, this is still not clear to me. So that's sort of the next, the next question to attack. <laughs> um, so one more comment from Roy, and he says, shall we use this method to avoid sampling error in molecular biomarker proxies in relation to microbial mass or stromatolites? That is a cool idea. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't have any experience uh, with uh, uh, any uh, biomarker work uh, in microbialites, but I think the potential to combine these methods uh, is huge and it would be very interesting. Um, the, the examples that I was showing were too old, so they don't preserve any useful biomarkers, I was told. Um, but if you work with younger ones, I think that uh, that should be really promising. No, what about um, isotopic signatures, like with a powdered sample of um, organic material, say? Should that still be preserved a little bit in your, in your material? Uh, do you mean um, uh, organic carbon isotopes or...? Uh, yeah, I mean, carbon, you could also maybe think about doing um, sulfur isotopes, something like that. Um, so they don't contain uh, a lot of organic matter. Um, I, I am not really up to date with the methods and I know that uh, the minimum amount that you need is decreasing continuously. So uh, maybe by today is already possible. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much you would need, but uh, you know, because they are so old, this, um, the examples I was referring to, so these microbial um, proliferation events in the Silurian that's uh, over 400 million years ago, 
Uh, so you would really need good preservation. But I, if anyone is interested uh, in trying, I would uh, certainly uh, try to help. Uh, but uh, I can't uh, really tell if it would work or not because uh, I don't know enough about this method. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Amelia, for this presentation. It was a really lovely webinar and I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. And we um, look forward to seeing you next week where Giovanni Coletti is going to be talking to us about calcareous algae and using those for paleoenvironment reconstructions. And we will see you then.